Well, thank you for attending the May 2013 OJM webinar. This is David Mandel. I'm one of the principals of OJM Group, and uh, I'm speaking today on asset protection planning, both at a uh, professional practice, like a medical practice, although if you're a uh, business owner, uh, these uh, concepts apply as well, and then, of course, on personal planning. I'm going to cover both of those topics. Uh, it's an area that we consult in uh, here at OJM Group, and uh, prior to that, for about 10 years, I was practicing law in the areas of asset protection. So uh, we will um, uh, go through those uh, topics, but before we do that, brief disclaimer, and basically this says that don't try this at home. Uh, some of these are legal and uh, uh, complicated uh, uh, subjects and that uh, you should consult with a uh, proper advisor and we hope that you uh, reach out to us uh, to chat with us about anything you've heard today. Here are some of the materials. We're not only speakers and uh, educators and uh, consultants and, and uh, planners for our clients, but we also write books and many of you listening to this may know that, but <clears throat> here is a uh, partial list of some of the books we've written for physicians uh, and for others over the years. You can see the Doctor's uh, Wealth Protection Guide down in the bottom corner, uh, right corner. Uh, that's a book that I uh, authored in 1998. In fact, uh, there's one hard copy version before that, the Doctor's Asset Protection Guide, which goes back to 1997, which I wrote. And then um, Risk Management for Practicing Physicians, a CME piece. The other books are the For Doctors Only book, which you certainly can get a copy of, and some of the ones we've done in certain states where the asset protection rules in those books apply specifically <clears throat> to the state uh, for which they're aimed, and we wrote that with lawyers in that state. Uh, you'll see Welk Secrets of the Affluent uh, is a book that, um, uh, that uh, uh, we wrote for the bookstores. I wrote it for John Wiley and Son who's the uh, largest um, uh, business book publisher in the world. And they, um, there's certainly some asset protection uh, section in that book as well. So we'll continue. So in today's presentation, <clears throat> we're going to cover corporate planning. We're going to talk about cash flow protection. We're going to talk about personal protection and even uh, uh, mention uh, asset protection in divorce because I get that question a lot from uh, potential clients. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about common liability traps. And in, uh, for physicians, this book, the CME piece, Risk Management for Practicing Physician, which I've co-authored with my father for the last 13, uh, let's say 15 years, <clears throat> and it's been uh, re-upped for accreditation every uh, three years. This gets into a lot of the risks that uh, doctors of all types uh, who deal with patients uh, face on a day-to-day -day basis. What are those? Well, you have certainly malpractice. I'll go to that bullet first uh, because we all know that uh, when you're dealing with patients, you've got that uh, liability. And if you're a business owner, you have customer or product liability. And if you're an advisor, you might have a, you know, malpractice from a client. So that's usually pretty well known and top of mind. Uh, some of these others are less well known or top of mind. Employer liability. Certainly if you have employees there's a whole host of rules out there on the federal and state level that if you fall foul of you could have liability for. Um, and uh, harassment, wrongful termination, wrongful firing, uh, violation of fiduciary duty rules, etc. In addition to that, specifically in the medical environment, because it's so regulated, you have uh, all sorts of billing issues, uh, overbilling, improper billing, fraud, violation of uh, kickback rules, um, Stark rules, and even from the private payers, uh, overbilling lawsuits and, and uh, clawbacks for, for money. Um, also, on the regulatory area, you've got uh, HIPAA <clears throat> for physicians and for any type of client. Premises liability, if you own a, a piece of property, slip and falls. And then, of course, we all have personal liability from anything from driving cars to having kids driving cars to uh, the dog uh, biting someone, all sorts of liability that's out there. So 
what does that mean? Does that mean we should stop practicing or stop uh, operating or driving? No. What it means is we need to be smart and uh, protect ourselves. Part of that is insurance. And we won't cover that today. <clears throat> but if you look in our books, we talk about that. And certainly it's part of an overall analysis is to have the right property and casualty insurance, anything from uh, malpractice insurance from professional liability side to you know homeowners to an umbrella policy. These are smart things to do, but they have coverage limits, they have exclusions, they have deductibles. Uh, so it's always important to layer on top of that asset protection planning, especially uh, if some of this planning can actually help you save taxes. We'll talk about how that can be achieved as well. Now, the background of an asset protection always starts with the sliding scale. This is a concept that I've been putting in the books for probably about a dozen years. And I think it's important we'll spend a couple of minutes on it because you want to have some relative value system so that uh, a client can understand what we in the field understand, which is that all asset protection is not created equal that when you look at a, uh, a, a technique or tool, you can't say, is this protect me or not? Am I protected? Those concepts, black and white, uh, don't apply uh, because every tool has certain strengths and benefits. Every exposure has certain, I wouldn't say strengths and benefits, but uh, certain weaknesses uh, uh, as opposed to others. So let's talk about the extremes, because every asset protection attorney will agree on the extremes. They might uh, uh, disagree to some, de to some uh, measure uh, uh, in the middle of the scale, but uh, most will agree on, on most of the scale, in fact. So at the top end of the scale, you've got assets that are totally protected. <clears throat> These, if you've done them at the right time and in the right way, um, are not subject to lawsuits. They're immune. They're lawsuit proof. They are even, um, in many cases, uh, survivable in bankruptcy. So if you've got an, you know, wealth in a state or federal exemption at the top of that scale, and you file for Chapter 7 bankruptcy to get rid of a terrible lawsuit, and not only a lawsuit, something that's turned into a judgment and a debt, so you have a million dollar debt, you have a hundred million dollar debt. You go into Chapter 7 bankruptcy, in many cases you can get rid of that debt. But the assets are going to pay the creditors. But if they're exempt assets, they're not part of that. So these are the most powerful tools. And you'd be surprised, but these are actually the most underutilized tools in most asset protection plans. Why? Well, they're not legal tools. Trusts are not exempt assets. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about asset protection trusts, uh, uh, foreign and domestic. Um, these are typically uh, state and federal exemptions, qualified retirement plans, or in some states, your home. I live in Florida, unlimited homestead exemption of value. Um, in some states, cash value insurance or annuities are exempt at a partial value, or in some states, an unlimited value. Well, if you're skeptical, you might say most people come to attorneys for asset protection. These don't make attorneys any money. These aren't offered by attorneys. That's why they're not used often. I'd say that's probably to some degree true. Okay. So the other important thing about exempt assets is, other than the federal exemptions, the state are very, very widely some states have very poor exemptions. California comes to mind. Some states have very strong exemptions. Florida, the best in the country. So you want to take advantage of those. Those are assets that are totally protected. The other end of the scale, again, most asset protection advisors would agree, are assets that have no protection whatsoever. These are those assets that if someone has a judgment against you, they can take that asset. They can levy it. They can put a lien on it, et cetera. This would be a non-exempt asset that you just own in your own name. Because if you own it in your own name, there's no exemption protecting, there's no protection there. Okay? Uh, a general partnership or a 
corporate owned asset vis-a-vis -vis corporate creditors is minus five. You have a corporation that owns a piece of real estate, the corporation has a liability, they can get to that real estate. There's no protection in between there. Uh, community property states where many people live, like California and many uh, Western states. Community property, any community debt generally is uh, uh, is uh, uh, powerful. Uh, uh, put it this way. Any community property is subject to any community debt, and most community debt is any debt that's acquired after the marriage. So typically, uh, community property is minus five because it's subject not only to one spouse's creditors, but both spouses' creditors. Okay? I put here spouse's name. That's uh, another discussion. Putting your assets in the spouse's name in non-community property states in some states, it's somewhat effective. In some states, it's not effective at all. And of course, it becomes on timing, what the asset is, how it's used and controlled. Now, in between, we've got ownership forms or tools that provide some protections, that provide some hurdles that make it more expensive, that make it more difficult, or may protect half the asset. Joint ownership, often in many states, non-community property states, half subject to the claim, half not. So I'm in a non-community property state. If I own something jointly and I get sued and I lose, they might be able to take half of that, typical rule. There's a subset of joint ownership called tenancy by the entirety, TBE. Okay? TBE in the states that have it, in some states offer a, another level of protection for all property. For some states, it's even less. It's just the real estate. But in those states, TBE property owned by a married couple is not subject to the claims of the creditors of one of the spouses. So in Florida, I live in a TBE state. If I have a bank account with my wife and tenancy by the entirety and I get sued and I lose a judgment, they cannot get to that asset. It's totally protected against them. But if we both were named in the claim, there'd be no protection whatsoever. So in some places, it's plus five. In some ways, it's minus five. Okay. Limited liability companies, LLCs, FLPs, family limited partnerships, very strong tools based on the charging order protections. We will talk about that later. And then all sorts of irrevocable trusts. A lot of clients come to me, they have a family trust, they have a revocable trust. Those are typically the same thing. If it's revocable, it provides no protection because you can revoke it, change it, get rid of it. If it's irrevocable, you can't change it, set in stone then yes, it can have protections if it's written properly, but you're giving the asset away to protect it to the beneficiaries. Now, they may be family members, and that may be okay with you. In some states, you can be one of the beneficiaries themselves. That is what a domestic asset protection trust, or DAPT, is. And those are relatively new in the last 10 years, and there's about 12 states that have them. If you're in those states, that kind of trust can be almost a plus five because you can protect it against your creditors but still have access to it. The only issue with those is they, they are somewhat unproven because in some states they're brand new. Ohio just passed a DAPT statute that went into effect March of 2013. So it hasn't been tested yet, but it seems like it's a very good tool for Ohio residents. So that gives you a little bit of the scale here. And I'm going to use that throughout the piece uh, today, throughout the talk, and often in our books. So it's good to have that background. The best asset protection is not asset protection. What does that mean? Well, it means one thing. If you go back to the scale, the, the tools at the top of the scale, state and federal exemptions, are not asset protection tools. People don't own a home for asset protection, even though they protect them. People don't put money in a 401k as an asset protection tool, typically. but it might protect them. People don't put money in an annuity or insurance policy, but in many states it's a great asset protection tool. So it's not by, by uh, coincidence that these tools that have other economic substances, the courts and the legislatures have been given uh, uh, the uh, top asset protection benefits tool. So if you're using a tool completely for asset protection purposes, like a domestic asset protection trust, timing becomes even more important because you're doing it 
just to get rid of or frustrate a creditor who was around when you set up that entity, you might lose all your protection through a fraudulent transfer claim. That's much less likely if you had a lot of other reasons to do the transaction, meaning buy a home, uh, even if someone was suing you, because uh, even if you get the asset protection. So it's really important to use in your planning a lot of tools that have non-asset protection purposes. So now let's talk a little bit about practice planning. Okay. The first thing I recommend a lot of medical practices do in every business, and we do it for ourselves, is have more than one entity. Really no reason for a successful business that cares, one, about tax reduction, and I know Carol spoke about that last month, and I'm sure we'll have other uh, webinars that you can uh, uh, listen to in our uh, library on tax planning. But if you use one entity, you can only use that tax benefit of that entity. We use multiple entities at OJM because I get benefits from a tax, an entity tax as a partnership, and I get benefits from an entity tax as an S corp, and I get benefits from an entity tax as a C corp. If I only had one, I'd only have one bite at the apple. Now I have three. Putting that aside, it also makes sense to have multiple entities because then you can protect multiple assets. Put different employees in the different entities, put different assets in the different entities. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that's exactly what you can achieve if you use multiple entities. Now, there's a limit to it. Although I do have a client who had, when I was practicing law, 30 different buildings. Of course, he had 30 different LLCs for those buildings because they were very valuable. And it was worth it to separate them. So if there's ever a claim regarding one building, it didn't affect the others. You've got to look at your business, and we help clients do that, often in a medical practice, keeping one as the main medical practice with the billing codes and all of that, and then separating off out a management company or a billing company or marketing company or maybe multiple, certainly real estate separated, maybe an equipment lease, um, often makes sense, something to consider. Same thing actually can be applied to your accounts receivable segregate the accounts receivable instead of having it owned by the practice, separate it into one LLC for each of the physicians. This gets back to the same concept. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And for many medical practices, especially the ones that are not cosmetic, the accounts receivable are the most valuable asset in their practice. When I was uh, practicing law, we were approached by a OBGYN a practice that had 80 or so OBGYNs and 20 million or so of receivables. And even though they had their formulas and their many offices around the state, um, and the many physicians who, who, who uh, built, legally it was all owned by the main entity because that was the only entity. And so one claim, one bad baby case, one malpractice case, would threaten all of those receivables. So they were very concerned about how to protect it they ended up implementing something like this where they had different entities and separated that AR rather than having it all sitting like a, uh, a minus five asset just waiting for that one terrible claim to come down. And that can be done for a small business, for a small practice, uh, for a large one. Typically there's no tax benefit, but if implemented properly, it should be able to be done with no tax negative either. It should be tax neutral. Same concept, we're, we're not getting too creative yet, uh, can apply to real estate and equipment. And I would say in real estate, this is where most business owners and physicians get their, get some asset protection advice, which is most medical practices, most businesses do not own their real estate in the main entity. They get the advice to separate it into a separate LLC and then lease it back to the main practice. Okay. and have the owners, sometimes it's all the owners of the practice, sometimes it's just the founding owners, and the new ones come in, they don't get to buy into the LLC that owns the real estate, but the main practice is paying rent. This is an example of asset protection. There may be some ways to layer in some buyout provisions, there may be some ways to uh, do something tax-wise, but generally this is done primarily for asset protection. The same thing can be done for equipment. Same thing can be done for valuable, valuable intellectual property. If you want to protect an asset from the claims of the business, you separate it 
and then you lease it back. Probably the most interesting asset protection is cash flow protection. And the reason that is is because it can help you save taxes. The chance of one losing an asset in a lawsuit is pretty low, even for high liability physicians. It's low because you're going to have your malpractice insurance, and that's going to cover you for typically you know, one, three million dollars, some kind of high number of coverage. And that may be enough for the attorney and the client to move on. Now, in the vast majority of cases, it's not even going to get that far. It's going to be found for the defendant or settled or what have you. But there are certainly cases where clients can lose assets in a personal lawsuit. It's low, but it's possible. That's why we want to protect against it, just like you get fire insurance on your home. The chance of you, your home you know, burning down is low, but you don't want to take that chance. But here, when we talk, talk about ta uh, cash flow protection, unlike the chance of losing an asset in a lawsuit is low, the chance of paying taxes is 100% every quarter and every year. So why not, if you can do some things to protect the practice and valuable assets in your cash flow and save taxes, why wouldn't you do it? Very simple. So what are we going to talk about? Tools that protect the cash flow but also save taxes, qualified retirement plans. We're going to talk about a Section 79 fringe benefit plan. I call it a hybrid plan. Uh, uh, and eventually we'll talk about captive insurance companies as another tool. Uh, most physicians and small businesses have qualified plans. The only ones that don't are typically those that uh, see that there's too many employees because the cost of employees is high, which is our number one bullet point. Now, asset protection is excellent. What does that mean? This is an exempt asset. Qualified retirement plans, if they're ERISA qualified, E-R-I-S-A, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, and you got to check if yours is. If you're a solo physician with no employees, it may not be. If you've got multiple employees, it probably is. Check with your TPA. Call us. Supreme Court case Patterson v. Shoemate said ERISA qualified plans are exempt in bankruptcy. These are protected in every state if they follow the rules. So it's a great place to have money in a qualified plan for asset protection purposes. This is how O.J. Simpson who had a $28 million judgment against him that we all knew about from the 1990s, a uh, wrongful death claim, uh, still was able to have money. People say, well, I wasn't he broke. They, they, they got $28 million bucks against him. Well, because they can't touch his qualified plan. So whether it's NFL pension or Hertz pension, whatever it was, couldn't be touched. Okay. So, um, but you got to cover all your eligible employees. And for some owners, it's very expensive. And it not only prevent some from having the plan, but more often they have the plan, but they just don't put that much in it. And if they put, and they maximize how much there is, it's not that much for high income taxpayers. So Max is at around 50,000, the typical defined contribution plan. The second bullet is actually much more important to me, which is the full income taxation on withdrawal. So the way a qualified plan works is you put money in, you get a deduction today, it grows tax free, but when you pull it out, you're going to pay ordinary income taxes. So the question is, is that a good deal or not? Right? We don't want to do a bad deal just to protect assets. Well, here's the highest marginal federal rate only. So it doesn't include your state income tax if you've got one. Most states do. Uh, every 10 years on that even year. So you could Google up and get uh, all the data points, but it gives you a general picture, which is that for most of the 19th, uh, 20th century, most 1900s, the highest federal rate was above 60%, okay? and in some cases above 80% for about 20 years. Um, but obviously for the last 10 or 20 years, it's been much lower. We just had the fiscal cliff that raised the rate, okay? uh, but we're still at a marginal top rate of 39.6. We have a lot higher to go before we get to our long-term running average. So I believe that tax rates for high-income tax rate, uh, payers are going to go up. So I'm not a huge fan of qualified plans for the tax benefit today if I think the tax rates are going to go up in the future. But the asset protection is also top, plus five. 
So do I tell clients to get rid of qualified plans? No. Do I get rid of my qualified plan? No. But I realize this is a tool that has some significant negatives. Cost for the employees, taxation on the way out, maybe higher than today. Maybe a bad deal tax-wise. I use my father as an example. I saw his tax return from 1977. He was paying over 70% federal tax rate plus state. He was putting money in a qualified plan, getting a deduction against that 75% state federal rate. Now he's in Florida, pays no state income tax, going to pull it out. This year he's 71. Marginal uh, has to take his uh, mandatory distribution. He's going to pull it out at a top rate of 39.6. So put it in, 75 deductions, pay tax at 39. Much better deal, right? Great deal. But what is, what's our deal going to look like for folks who are putting money in qualified plans today and pulling it out in 20, 30 years? I have no idea. But I do know that this is a hedge. This, this, this tool is a bet that rates don't go up a lot. Because if I told you right now that when you retire, tax rates are going to be back to 70%, you would not put money in your qualified plan. You would use something like a Roth IRA. You pay your tax today, grow it tax-free, pull it out tax-free. Well, the next tool we're going to talk about actually allows you a partial deduction, and you grow it tax-free and take it out tax-free. So it's a terrific fringe benefit tool that can sit alongside your qualified plan. They both they work in, uh, or they excel in different environments. Turns out I'm wrong. Tax rates are really low in the future. Qualified plan was the right tool. Turns out I'm right, and tax rates in the future are higher. Fringe benefit plan. Uh, it turns out to be the uh, uh, big winner. So I like clients to diversify and hedge their bets and have money in different places, especially if it's well protected. So qualified plan, well protected, but has some tax negatives. But if you're going to do a qualified plan, you might as well do it as best you can. So are the formulas right? Are the cost for employees right? Could you benefit from a combination plan that defines a con uh, uh, defined benefit and con defined contribution, which allows you to put a lot more away? Those are the things that our benefit planning division can help you. Now, a lot of people think IRAs are just like qualified plans, but they're not. A SEP IRA may work like a profit sharing plan in terms of the same amount you can go in, and the taxation is the same, gross tax-free, take it out tax-free. But from asset protection purposes, it doesn't. If you're in federal bankruptcy rules, yes, you get that federal exemption. But if you're not normal lawsuit situation, you're going to, or if you elect for your state exemption in bankruptcy, it's going to depend on your state exemption. Most states do protect IRAs in an unlimited way. Some don't. California provides uh, a very, I think, minimal amount of protection for IRAs because it leaves it up to a judge. So for some clients, the asset protection strategy in states like California, and they have their large balances, would be to create a qualified plan and roll their IRA into it. Because the IRA, really, you can't have a lot of confidence in California that it's protected. Uh, it's up to a judge. And a judge will look at the typical Californian and say, hey, the typical California has about 50000 saved. You have, doctor, $2 million in your IRA? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let $1.95 million be taken by the creditor and leave you with 50000 just like every other citizen of our state. That's not protection, and you have no idea until the judge decides. So I don't um, uh, like IRAs in certain states, uh, even though they're basically inexpensive to set up, but uh, I like qualified plans better. Now, while most, qualif most businesses or certainly medical practices have a qualified retirement plan, profit sharing plan, 401k something, very few have significant fringe benefit plans. And Section 79 describes one fringe benefit plan uh, where the asset protection is in about 20 states a plus five. And in the other 30 states can be structured uh, inside of an LLC or trust for plus two protection. And what I like about it is, as I mentioned before, one, you don't have to cough, cover every eligible employee depending on how many employees you have. You might be able to carve out a group of 10 if you have more than 10 employees. If you have less than 10 or 10, you have to cover everybody. You can do this in addition to your qualified plan, 401k profit sharing. So this is not an either or. We don't tell clients to stop their qualified plan. Keep it. Add this on. Give yourself something in addition if you can 
Do you have the capacity and the interest to put more dollars away and save more taxes? The third bullet's really important. If you're in a group practice or you have a group, uh, group of attorneys or a group of CPAs or whatever, business owners, not everybody's going to agree how much they want to put away. And this plan allows complete choice among each participant of how much they want to contribute into the plan. So the asset protection is at the highest level in many states, it's at a solid level in the others. It can be done in addition to your qualified plan. It has tremendous tax benefits, okay, uh, because you get a partial deduction today, tax-free growth, and if managed properly, no taxes when you take the money out. So it's an ideal hedge against future income taxes and capital gains tax increases, and an ideal hedge against your qualified plan. Yet, less than, I would say, 3% of the clients who come to us have even heard of this plan, never mind put it in place. So I think this is a plan whose time has come when done conservatively, when done properly. Okay? And you got to follow the rules because there are safe harbor rules, the things you need to do. Okay? Uh, the other thing that's key about this plan, and I call it a hybrid plan, is that it's only available for C corporations. And so there are very few businesses that operate as C corporations, say very few, but probably about 15, 10 for 15 percent of medical practices. So if you're an S corporation already, you may not have even heard of this plan because you can't use it. This gets back to my prior recommendation on corporate structure, why it might make sense to have more than one entity. So you could do this, exactly what we do. We have multiple entities for different parts of our business. One is taxed as a C corporation. It allows us to implement this type of plan. Okay? So these things are related, corporate structure and benefit planning. The other tool I'll talk about for a minute is a small captive insurance company. I've been working with small captives since the late 90s. In the last three to five years, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new firms out there who've become captive so-called experts. I stay away from these firms. Because this is a very complicated tool. We don't set up captives at OJM Group. We don't set them up. We don't manage them. We don't do tax returns for them or actuarial reports or anything. What we do is manage the assets like we do for uh, hundreds of clients. We manage about $250 million for clients around the country. And a very small portion of that is for our clients inside of captives. But we know about this tool because I used to practice law and I'm familiar with it. These are complicated arrangements. You're creating a real insurance company. We recommend clients do it in the U.S. because there's about eight states or so that in the last decade have implemented captive legislation that allows uh, uh, for a streamlined process and lower expenses so you don't have to go offshore like you used to do back in the 90s when I first was working with these. So you can set them up in different states like South Carolina or Utah or Kentucky, Delaware. Why would you do that? Well, every business, every medical practice has risks they don't have insurance for, whether that be coverage limits, that one three coverage as a doctor, what about two six? You've got exclusions. You've got claims that you haven't even thought about or that you uh, know our business risks, but you never thought you would get insurance for them. Well, on any of these things, if you currently have no insurance for it, then if you set up a captive and have that captive insured for it, you're not uh, taking any on, even through your captive, any more risk than you had before. But what you're doing is, is taking on in a formal way and paying for coverage now. And if you own that captive, you might be willing to do that. And there's tremendous tax benefits for that because the, the Congress, since 1986 and even in some other sections before that, encourages people to set up small insurance companies because sometimes small insurance companies become medium companies and sometimes medium companies become large companies. State farm, farmers, these all started as very small companies with like 20, 30 people, uh, people setting up things like this. They grew into some of our largest corporations in the U.S. And so um, 
Congress allows certain tax benefits for these small companies to try to let them grow, just like they do for oil and gas companies and other different uh, uh, areas of the tax code. And so when done properly, you can reduce taxes by, from an active medical practice or a successful company by hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, provide more risk management coverage, have some wealth accumulation plan for the captive uh, for the future, uh, even tie into buyouts or state planning, and um, do so in an asset protected environment. You can have the captive owned by an irrevocable trust. You have the captive owned by an LLC limited partnership. So you can get very strong protections, okay, almost up to plus five or plus five in some states, and you get all these other benefits as well. Tax is very attractive, risk management, asset protection, estate planning, etc. So if a captive is something that you're interested in, we're happy to chat with you about it. So all of those things, qualified plans, corporate structure, um, captives, benefit plans, can help you save taxes and protect your assets. Now, when we talk about uh, personal planning, there's not going to be much that's going to help you save taxes, but it's going to get to the heart of what we're talking about today, which is protecting the assets. So let's talk about that. First, how do you own your asset? Again, if you own it in your own name and there's no exemption, minus five. If you own it in the spouse's name, certainly minus five to her creditors or his creditors, depending on who you are. And it may not have any protection or at least half vulnerability to yours. So the idea, a lot of physicians come to me, oh, well, my wife doesn't practice medicine or my husband doesn't practice medicine. I'm just going to put all my assets in their name. I always ask them, well, what happens if you get divorced? And they say, well, of course, it's still 50-50. I mean, I own, living in the house or it's still I get to spend the money. Well, of course. You haven't really gifted away. So the lawyer on the other side isn't that stupid to realize you haven't done that. So uh, uh, it's really not that effective. Otherwise, if you think it is really truly that effective, then you would agree that when you get divorced, you lose it all. You really can't have it both ways. That Now, in some circumstances, I'm not saying that, that doesn't apply in every circumstance in every state, but the general rule is that's not going to be an effective way to protect the asset, and you have better ways. Tenancy in common, joint ownership are typically 50-50. So you own that 50-50, you get sued, 50% can be lost. You both get sued, it all could be lost. Tenancy by the entirety I talked about. Community property I talked about, minus five across the board. Okay. So what do we do? I like to start with exempt assets as I talked about when we looked at the chart. Right? Take advantage of what the state gives you. Maximize your plus five assets. Why? Because you don't have to pay a lawyer. You don't have to gift assets away to kids or other family members. You don't have compliance costs. You don't have tax returns and accounting fees. You don't have uh, state fees and, and, and fees to lawyers every year, which you're going to have when you start to use trusts and limited partnerships and LLCs, manager fees or trustee fees, legal fees, accounting fees, state fees. Doesn't mean they don't make sense, and I have them myself. But if you have a state that's giving you an asset that you can own, control, and have access to at any time, and it's totally protected from lawsuits at a plus five level, you should be using it. But again, as I mentioned before, this is where we see more clients have less of their wealth in the exempt assets than they should every single time. Okay? So start with exempt assets. Depends on your state. Now, even in a state like Florida, we have an unlimited homestead exemption. We have tenancy by the entirety. We have a wage account. No other state in the country has that. We have unlimited exemption for cash value life insurance. We have unlimited exemption for cash value annuities. Most clients are not going to have all of their assets, 100% of their net worth, in those three or four asset classes. Some will. Most won't. And in the other states, you're not even getting anywhere close to getting your assets plus five across the board like that. So LLCs and FLPs, limited liability companies and family limited partnerships, are building blocks of asset protection. I set up probably a thousand of these when I was practicing law. I've reviewed another thousand from clients when they've come to us at OGM Group over the last seven years. So I know these in and out. 
they're very good tools. There are certain states you should set them in. There's certain language you need to put in them. There's certain formalities that need to go on. There's a certain maintenance program that a local attorney needs to put in place. It's got to be done right. This is not a set it up and then never look at it again. You won't get the protections. But if you do, the protections work like this. Charging order rules. What this means is if I own an investment account in my name and I get sued, it's minus five, they can put a levy on the account tomorrow, they can put a lien on it, take it. If I own that same investment account in a joint situation, let's say of community property, again, it can all be taken. In a joint uh, ownership position, uh, uh, in a non-community property state, probably half of it is vulnerable. But I own that same investment account, but inside of a properly done LLC or limited partnership, then even in a community property state, even a state where I own it in my own name, they cannot get to it if it's done right. They cannot get to the asset. They cannot take it. Not only that, they cannot become a partner in that LLC or limited partnership. They cannot touch the assets inside, as I said. They cannot get voting rights, and they can't force that entity outside. Again, this assumes it's done right. This assumes you haven't put this in there when you already knew or should have known about the creditor. The timing's right. All of those things. So what does it allow them? Well, it allows them a, a significant rule. It, it says if, if any assets come out of that entity, once they have a charging order, they can take it. So they have a right to distributions. So it's not perfect. And there's some attorneys out there who I respect a lot who have some real doubts about LLCs, limited partnerships, as significant asset protection tools because the creditor can sit there with a charging order for years and years and years. And you can never get that money out. Yeah, you can pay yourself some management fee, but it's going to be tiny. It's going to be a challenge. So, yes, they can't get to the asset, but neither can you. So it's certainly better than no protection where they just take it, right? Or half protection where they take half. But it's not the end-all, be-all. I still recommend them for a lot of clients because it's better than the alternatives. And in most cases, you're worried about contingency fee lawyers who aren't that sophisticated, who just want to get a dollar today and move on because they're not billing by the hour. And so if you show them that they're not going to get to this, but you settle out for 10, 15 cents on the dollar, they'll take it and move on to the next case. And I get that. And that's why I do recommend these, and these are important to have. But the reason I started with the sliding scale is so important is you've got to realize this is not the same as an exempt asset. You can't say, oh, I've got my, my assets are protected. I don't need to put any money into an exempt asset because I have an LLC that protects me. Well, this is what it will do for you at best. If you use that LLC to pay personal bills, if you didn't pay its fees, if you didn't probably do the tax returns, if you didn't do some uh, 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 gifting of those LLC or limited partnership interest to, to kids on an annual basis and do something that was for non-asset protection purposes, even if you did all of that, this is the best you're going to get. They're going to get a right to distributions. You're going to have to negotiate with them. Exempt asset, you don't have to talk to them. They can't touch it. You can take all the money out and go through a big party. It's exempt. So all protection is not the same. That's what I'm trying to tell you. These are good tools and important tools, but doesn't mean you are protected. So how's the best ways to get the best protection? It's got to be compliance with annual formalities. Have to have the proper language. I can't tell you how many times, it's probably been 100 in the last couple of years, I've reviewed partnership and LLC agreements and they don't have the right asset protection language. So even what I just showed you on charging orders is debatable. They may be able to get in there and get the asset. You have no protection. You think you do, but you don't because the language is not there. That LLC or limited partnership was drafted by a business attorney or a state planning attorney. Someone didn't know what the language is supposed to be. I've seen the work of 200 law firms now, and, and I can tell you a lot of them don't have the right language, and the ones that have good language I've taken. And now I make that the standard for my clients. And... Uh, if they don't have that, then I'm going to allow them to add that new great language to their entity. So I really think that we're adding a lot of value to our clients on their entity agreements. You've got to work with the right people. Now, 
even LLCs and limited partnerships are not good tools generally for owning the home because you're going to give up some tax benefits. And if you have debt on it, it's not going to work anyway. So what's the best way to protect your home? Well, be lucky enough to be in a state where you have a strong exemption. Back to the exemptions again. And Florida, unlimited homestead exemption. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, zero. Most states, somewhere in between. So take what the home gives you. And again, with the lowest interest rates on record lately, when I hear about clients who are concerned about asset protection and to understand finance, trying to pay down their home quickly, doesn't make any sense at all, unless they're in a state that has strong homestead exception. But if they're in a state that doesn't, all they're doing is creating more vulnerable minus five equity that's very hard to protect. So these are not clients like Susie Orman I'm talking about who really have debt issues and don't make much money and need to get down debt. I get that. I'm talking about my clients who are making hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year and are saying, how can I not expose myself to lawsuits? And on the other hand, they're paying down their interest rate, which may be all of three or four percent which means they don't think they can do better than that with their other investments. And they're creating more vulnerable equity. So um, it's something to look at and consider. Again, in most states, just putting the home in the spouse's name, if their spouse is not liable, doesn't make, isn't effective. You're still living there. Your income's still paying the mortgage. Again, if it's community property, it's community property. Uh, a trust is possible qualified personal residence trust, but you're giving the home away forever. Very difficult to do with debt on it. And um, after a term of years, you got to pay rent. And that trust owns the property. And benef their beneficiaries, you don't own it anymore. So again, if it's part of your estate plan or plan to gift to family members, terrific. <clears throat> it also has asset protection. But if you really need that as part of your net worth, it doesn't make sense. Debt shield basically means keep debt on the property as much as you can, or get new debt, meaning refinance, and do something with that cash to protect it. It doesn't mean take that money and go spend it. <clears throat> it just means take your equity and put it somewhere else. If you think of a pie chart of your net worth, if you're in a state where home uh, homestead is limited, let's say, uh, I believe that uh, Massachusetts is $500,000, significant amount, much better than most states. Let's say you got a million dollar home. I might tell you, again, from a financial point of view, our advisors might say, you know, get if you're buying a home, get as uh, put as little down as possible and finance as much as you can, given your cash flows to client, depending on their situation. But because uh, interest rates are so low, and why why would you not take advantage of three percent money, three and a half percent money, if you can put money in the market, which did you know sixteen percent last year? Okay, well, that depends on the client. Who knows? That depends on your situation. But from an asset, asset protection point of view, let's say I have a client who has, in Massachusetts, who has uh, uh, $400,000 of equity in the home and 600000 of debt, and they're saying, I got an extra two hundred grand. what should I do with it? Well, if they pay down their mortgage quicker with that two hundred, now they're just starting to, after the 500000 level, build up equity that is unprotected. So I might say, why don't you put 100000 in, get to the maximum of your uh, homestead exemption, and then take the other 100000 and put it in something like an LLC or a limited partnership or an exempt asset, another exempt asset in the state. So again, it's using debt as you need to move the assets to the right place. So you've got to be smart, you've got to be done right, you've got to be properly advised. But uh, that's the concept. Now, a second home or real estate uh, investment in real estate or, you know, raw land, their LLCs are great tools because you don't have the state, the same tax benefits or issues with the home as you do with your second home. So a lot of times I might advise a client to have their main home, have more debt on it, have their second home, they pay down and, um, uh, and uh, they um, put that second home in an LLC. So they have one property that has a lot of debt. The other property has almost has no debt. 
and they put one in their name, which is a protected because there's not much equity there, and one in the LLC because it has a lot of equity. That often is a, 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 an issue. Now, a trust to protect wealth, as I mentioned before, the only trusts that protect wealth are irrevocable. I don't have time today to do a, a webinar just on this, on all the different types of trusts there are. But every single one on this list has its own purpose, has its own strengths and weaknesses. They're all irrevocable. Now, offshore trust and domestic asset protection trusts may allow you access to some of that. Spousal access trusts will allow spouse access to it. Uh, uh, charitable remainder trust, CRT, will allow you an income stream back. So yes, you have to give it away, but there may be some strings attached that you could get something back in certain circumstances. Got to be advised by the proper people and see if it makes sense as part of your plan. But if they're irrevocable and are done properly, they could be protected against your creditors. And if you're thinking long-term multi-generation, they could be written to protect against your kids' creditors. So your kid gets divorced or sued, et cetera. They don't lose the asset, stays in the family. A little bit about us as I wrap up. Talked about today, protecting the practice or business and the assets there. Talked about cash flow and protecting that, and especially how to save taxes. We've talked about having personal, protecting personal assets and the importance of exempt assets, limited partnerships, LLCs, irrevocable trusts, debt shields, et cetera. Asset protection is one area that we consult with our clients on. We have 1,000 clients in 48 states. My area of expertise, obviously, is asset protection, corporate structure. I know a fair amount about tax. We've got tax people. We've got benefit plan people. We've got insurance people. We have investment people, certified financial planners, uh, CPAs, MBAs, all sorts of designations. We'd love to talk to you about what we do. We can work with a client and be their kind of quarterback and look at everything comprehensively at a business or personally. We can look at just one issue. I've had clients call me and say, I just want an asset protection plan. I want you to look at all my assets, write out a plan, and help me implement it. We can do that. So if you found this valuable, I hope you contact us to chat with us. Uh, I will tell you one unique thing, our firm commitment. If you qualify, meaning you have your own business or practice, and we're looking at elements that include tax planning and you have a certain income, we can get engaged. and we can, If we can't show you ways to double our fee, in taxes, we'll refund our entire fee. Okay, so that's pretty unique. I encourage you to contact us to chat about how we might help you. Chat about issues I brought up today, and you have questions on. Happy to do that as well. So uh, uh, take a look at what we've got on the website. Get one of our books. Listen to other of our webinars, and hopefully, we'll talk with you soon. Thank you.